If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask that you took a turn to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 16 is where we'll take our text this morning. Uh, continue to pray for our missionaries and Brother Petrine, I pick him out up at the airport, uh, the airport on the 19th, I mean, excuse me, the 29th, which is Friday, and he will be with us till the next Thursday. And um, he will be preaching for me on Sunday and uh, probably Adam's class, if you're okay with that, uh, Sunday evening, and then preaching again Wednesday night. So looking forward to seeing Brother Catrine, and he can tell us what's going on in South America. Uh, Numbers chapter 16, beginning in verse 23. Number 16, beginning in verse 23. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get ye up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto, went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram, on every side, and Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all those works, for I have not done any of for I have not done them of my own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord ha uh, make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up, with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he made an end of the speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their horses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your holy word this morning. Uh, we thank you and praise you It's unchangeable, that it's steadfast and true. God, we praise you uh, that we have it in our own language and it's easy to understand. God, we pray now that you would bless this word to the hearts of the hearers, and Lord, that you would gain souls for your glory, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus, amen. Now, some somewhat familiar verses of scripture, and uh, I'll be preaching the Lord help, being my helper this morning now, on the things, when the things you're depending on begin to fail. Uh, we, we often put our faith and our trust on things that are subject to break, that are subject to fall, that are subject to failure, and we will see even the most steadfast thing we can think of is not necessarily stable in the way which we think it. Now, uh, we're going to go back to our text verse in uh, verse 23. And I want you to see the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And the Lord is going to give Moses a message, and then Moses is going to take the message to the congregation of Israel. Now, the most thing that is loved by a preacher is to have a message given by the God Almighty and being able to uh, transfer it or to take it to the people. Now, the difficult part comes then, this when the news is not good, when the message is not necessarily uh, palatable to our spiritual taste, 
when it's difficult uh, to take, at least in the flesh, that's when it's hard. Now, uh, Moses is going to get one of these message, messages that are not so palpable, and he was to take them to the rebellion. He was, taking, was to take them to the people that were in direct opposition to him. Now, verse 24, again, the Lord God of heaven speaking, speak unto the congregation, saying, Get ye up from about the tabernacle of Korah and Dathan and Abiram. Now, I want you to notice two things. Uh, the message of deliverance was not for Korah and Abiram and Dathan's people. It was for the people that was around them. All right. The message of deliverance doesn't come to uh, the despised, it comes to the beloved. And then also I want you to see, and as many times as I've studied these scriptures, I don't guess I've ever seen that, what does it say to get away from? The tabernacle of, of Dathan, Abiram, and Korah. In other words, they done raised up a false religion. They had done raised up a false god. Uh, to have a tabernacle, you have to have a, a God to put in within the tabernacle. And they were done doing false worship. And God's people was getting intermingled with that. And, and very frequently today, you see in this world that very thing happen. God's people beginning to uh, intermingle with the world. Now, all of y'all will remember uh, years ago... Uh, uh, Jimmy Oliver wanted to have a big uh, festival uh, get together, or maybe he didn't start it, but said that we would participate with a Christmas uh, get together, and we'd go from the Methodist Church to the Free Will Church, and then down to Mama Smell's Church. You know what? God is not within a thousand miles of that mess. That's taken into the to the tabernacle of Korah. Uh, very same thing, very same situation. And uh, God's people ought to have nothing whatsoever to do with that kind of thinking. And so the Lord God knew of this false tabernacle, and he says, you go down there and you get your people out. Verse 26, and he spake unto the congregation and said, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. Now, I want you to see the next caution was not to get involved with them. Don't touch them. Don't get involved in their sin. Now, often we think of biblical separation as a New Testament doctrine. But I want you to see it as old as, as the Word of God itself. It's as old as mankind. You remember in the in the garden, he says you can have all of it except. Even in the end, they were to be separated from the tree of life and separated from the, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They were to be separate from those two things. And they couldn't even do that, and we can't either. So I want you to see that the message of deliverance was good. Verse 27, obedience. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah and Dathan and Abiram on every side. You know what? The, what thrills the heart of a pastor or any kind of leader, Moses in that day, the leader of the children of Israel, is obedience on the part of his people. Now, I want you to see when the Lord God gave this message in verse 22, it was never for Korah, Abiram, and uh, Dathan, he says, you tell my people. Uh, all they were doing is showing exactly who they were. They were showing their character. They were showing, they were manifesting their sinful hearts. They were showing exactly what lost people do and how lost people act. They were just demonstrating who they were. And so he, uh, this message of deliverance did not come to them. Now there was this, and Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. Now I about can imagine what this was when Dathan and Abiram came out and just, what are you going to do about it, Moses? Mm -hmm. Obstinate. 
rebellious. They weren't scared. You know, lost people just aren't scared of God's judgment. Now, they can pretend to be, but they're not. Uh, that's why uh, preaching simply on hell won't motivate a sinner to Christ. It's because they're really deep down not afraid of it. Uh, they may say they are, but they're not. And so we find a Byram and Dothan, uh, Dothan, excuse me, gets out there, folds their arms, upset and mad. What are you going to do about it, Moses? What's next? Now notice what it says, verse 28. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. Now, I want you to see that uh, he says, at this moment, you're going to see that God has sent me. Now, if you read back in this text, uh, at the beginning of this chapter, the whole thing that uh, 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 Abiram and Dothan and uh, Korah wanted was to go back to Egypt. That was their plan. He said, you've led us out here for nothing. We want to go back. You know, you know what the ministry of this world is? Is for you to go back to sin. Not to lost condition, because that's an impossibility, but if you can wander around in sin, and people stand back and make fun of you, and you have no, uh, no appearance of a person of God, that's what, that's what the devil wants. And living down in Egypt was just that. That was going back to the world, and that was their desire, and now uh, he's, he said, you're going to remember that I came uh, not within my own power. Verse 29, if these men die the common death of all men, in other words, die on their deathbed, die naturally, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord had not sent me. But, if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up and all that appertain unto them and they go down quick into the pit which is another word sheol another for hell then you shall understand these men have provoked the Lord now I want you to see that whenever he is uh, he's preparing the situation he says you're not going to die the common way you're not going to die the routine way. Now, what they have always depended on is what they were standing on. Remember, uh, we're, we're supposedly a people standing on the solid rock of Christ. Now, that's the only thing that will not fail. You look out all around here on this hillside where the building is at, we've all walked up and down every square inch of it at one time or another, and you know what? It's always hell, hasn't it? It's always been stable. It's something that we can depend on, this old building. It's something stout. We built it ourselves. We know what it consists of. We, we depend on it. Those are not the type of things that we should depend upon. Um, it wouldn't take but one move of the hand of God and this thing collapse around itself. That, 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 is, that is the... Uh, the carnal way of thinking is depending on oneself. See, uh, Korah and his bunch doubted the sovereignty of God. They doubted that Moses was their leader. They doubted that they, uh, uh, that they believed they were all sustainable. But they found out without the work of God, even the solid ground be beneath their feet meant nothing without God. And it's the very same with us. The, the, it, it, we are completely dependent on God. Whatever can burst upon your mind, seen, if it's money, if it's land, if it's vehicles, if it's homes, nothing is stable in this world. The only thing that comes eternally out of this world is your never dying soul. That's the only thing that really matters. That's the only eternal thing. And uh, Korah and his bunch found out the hard way. Verse 31, And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, not under anybody else, <laughs> and the earth opened her mouth, verse 32, and swallowed them up, 
and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, they and all that appertained unto them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed her uh, and closed upon them, and they perished among the congregation. That is depending on something that will not stand. Now, in, in the modern day, many, many people do that. Many people uh, just uh, stand on what someone else tells them. You know why I'm amazed in the uh, modern day, and I watch some of these uh, younger preachers do it, and there's nothing... Uh, there's nothing wrong of looking into the words of uh, 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 T.P. Simmons and, and uh, others, but listen, they were mortal men. And you know what? That ground claims asunder. It, it, it falls beneath them. It, it, it's no longer there. Only, the only thing that we can depend on is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, those men were not inspired. They were not... Uh, they were not God-directed. And, and so we find as the Lord's people, what we think many times is stable, in fact, is not. The only stability that is offered in this life is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's it. That's the only thing. There's not one more thing that we can depend on but Him. Now, uh, take the oak pews that you're sitting on, and those are real oak pews. They're not oak veneer. They're the real deal. How many knows what's at the end of each of these short pews going that way? They're cracked up and down the side, all four of them. And you know why? They sat in front of the heat at that Methodist building, and it dried them out, and it cracked them. Uh, I would just think they're not as stable as these, would you? You see, but I see none of y'all, but I see other people popping them down here and sitting down, and they're dependent to hold them up so far it has. But we depend on unstable things. We, we, the only thing that we really need to depend on is the Word of God. Not, not statements of theology, not uh, doctrinal statements, just the Word of God plus nothing and minus nothing. Uh, a lot of churches today, oh, we better come up with some bylaws uh, or the sodomites will creep in on us. No, no, no. The law was defeated by grace, and the last thing we need is a bunch of men trying to follow laws that could never be kept to start with. They're not solid ground. It will fall beneath you. Now, go with me uh, to the book of Job. Job chapter 1. Now, Job, uh, the way that uh, we understand, was a very wealthy man. He had things going for him. Very rich farmer. Man that um, had many, many possessions. Had a relationship with the Almighty. He had a dependable life. Or did he? You know, it don't take but one thing that everything you work for is gone like that. Right. He did not have the, the, the stability that he thought. In fact, uh, who was the author of his stability? The Almighty. Remember, remember when the Lord God Almighty said, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. One that followeth God and escheweth evil. He says, have you not built a hedge about him? You know what? That hedge was real. Uh, the devil wasn't blowing smoke on that. He said, okay, I'll take the hedge away. You know what? I bet Job had started depending on that hedge, don't you? Uh, I believe he started depending not only the protection of his soul, but the protection of his finances in the Almighty. He he gotten used. You know what? We get used to that barrier many times, and when it's gone, we're not sure what we're going to do. Right? We're not certain what the next step may be. And, and so it was with Job. Uh, read with me in verse uh, Job uh, chapter one, uh, verse five. Job chapter one, 
In verse 5, the Bible says, and it, and it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job says, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, I want you to notice a number of things in this text. And if you, uh, if you know it, verse 4 said that they were down at their oldest, their eldest brother's house, and they were having this party, and uh, there were uh, there were things going on that Job clearly knew that God was not pleased with. That he knew and understood they were against what uh, the law of God was at that time, and uh, he was making intercession for them. Notice that it was so. When the days of their feasting was gone about, they had these annual feasts that Job sent and sanctified them. Now, let me tell you, dear friend, you can't intercede on anybody's behalf, not even yourself. Should we pray? Absolutely. Should we, can we offer atonement for their sin? Absolutely not. No way whatsoever. And that's what they, that Job's attempt was to do. First of all, I want you to see his attitude, his look on what had happened. It may be that my children had sinned. He knew what was going on. Job wasn't no dummy. Very intelligent man. Uh, been a whole lot better to be honest about it, wasn't it? And then lastly, it says, and he made sacrifice for them. The only person that can make an atonement for you is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only, play, the only person that can intervene upon your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what Job did did not take the penalty of sin away from his children. And uh, again, you know what? I believe just like Job depended on that fence that was about him, had he not built the wall about him, he depended on that. And you know what? Job's children depended on Job. You know what happened to Job? <laughs> he got old and sick, did he not? Not much to depend on. Now go with me a little further down, this time in verse 18. You know, in the interim of those verses, and I'm going to read it because it's repetitive, but Job lost all his finances. Everything he possessed was gone. Everything that he thought he had worked so hard for was no longer with him. In verse 18, the worst yet happens. And while he was yet speaking, the one that came with the message from the Chaldeans that the camels and everything had been gone, and while he was yet speaking, there came also another that said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped to tell thee. Now, with Job's wealth, I have to assume that his house was pretty nice, the youngest bro I mean the eldest brother's house. Uh, you try to do what you can to set up your children with housekeeping the first time. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, I necessarily set Adam up that well in the little house under the hill, but we spent a lot of time working on it. Uh, but I mean, for the winds coming off, I bet it was a house they could depend on. They'd gone up there time and time again to party. They'd gone there, and uh, no doubt Job had helped build it himself and helped finance the construction, and they were depending on the house to stay. We do that, do we not? We just depend that things will always be like they are. But you know what? They're not. Change, time changes everything. You look back across your life, and I would dare to say if I went to Carlisle today, except for one family that I know for sure, most of them are dead. 
there's not one person living in the same house that was when I was 12 years old. Time changes everything. So this false dependence that the brother and the other children had on what was established by their father, some strong winds came and blew it all away in a moment's time. We cannot be dependent. We cannot look at stability in this present evil world. That's why he says you are pilgrims and strangers. Don't put your roots down. Don't depend on what this world has to offer. And you know what? A lot of times what, in a spiritual sense, what we become to our platform is not our redemption, not our salvation, but what we've been told the Bible teaches. Mm. And, you know, you know, a good, strong spiritual wind will blow that mess away. Think about it. 30 years ago, did, would you ever dream that you believe that God predestined the people before the world began and died for them and them only? <laughs> We can call them a heretic, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. See, our other thing, our, our other mode of belief, the spiritual wind came and blew it down, didn't it? And, 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 and so we see then as the Lord's people that uh, we can't depend on anything but Christ. Yeah. The, mo the, mo the most stable thing that we could possibly think of is still simply dependent on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's gone, it's done with, there's nothing left to depend on. Go with me to Hebrews, and again, as I've often said, I believe the writer of Hebrews to be Paul. I believe he did not sign it off because... He thought probably it would have been swallowed better by the church in Jerusalem if they simply didn't know that he had written it. Uh, him and Peter had had more than one clash as Peter was starting to embrace the old Jewish traditions again. Uh, you know, uh, we have a lot of that going on today with the Messianic Jew movement. And you know what? They're doing no different than the first church, first Baptist of Jerusalem. They're adding back in the law. Oh, no, we're just celebrating the ceremonies. Well, funny for to me that I'm pretty sure Paul, uh, Paul wrote, <laughs> there's no one, no one day better than the other. <laughs> so if we have Hanukkah, I think we're saying that day is better than this day. And, and, and so we find then, as uh, the writer is writing to the church at Jerusalem, and uh, chapter 9, verse 5, uh, excuse me, verse 15, uh, verse 15, the Bible says this, And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, Christ and Christ alone. He is the mediator. He is the one that delves out the goods. Uh, when, when mother died, uh, what little bit was left, of money, some a third went to me, a third went to my brother, and a third went to her brother. Uh, who had the authority to make that decision? Mother, right? It was her stuff. Uh, she'd do whatever she wanted to. Uh, my niece, Ashley, got everything in the house. Uh, there were some things I would like to have, but you know what? They weren't mine to get. <laughs> The, uh, the, the one that was over it had the right. They belonged to mother. They didn't belong to me. And you know, redemption belongs to Christ. It does not belong to you. He'll meet it out by his sovereign hand. He, he, he'll give it to the ones that, uh, that he knows that are his. And so we find that he is our mediator. He is the one that goes between us and the God, Lord God Almighty. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of, it, of eternal inheritance. Now, I want you to see, uh, just as Brother Junior brought up in the Old Testament beliefs and how the annual sacrifice uh, went this speaks to them because it says uh, that he <laughs> that he fulfilled that for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament by the means of death 
for the redemptions of the transgressions that were under the First Testament or the Old Testament, he did it for them too, for, for those individuals, and he fulfilled it for us as well. Verse 16, for where a testament is, or a will, or a, a, a leaving of goods, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be death of the testator, or the one that gives out the spiritual means, that gives out the spiritual riches, for a testament is a, is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength all the while the testator liveth. In other words, as long as mama lived, what little bit she had, it belonged to her, and she still had dominion over it. And if she wanted to spend every dime what was left, you know what? It was her business to do it. In other words, redemption was always in the hands of the Almighty and always will be. And he mills it out to whom he will. Why? Because he's in control of it. Yeah. It belongs to him. It doesn't belong to us. Huh. And, and, and so we find that as Paul is writing to the church at Jerusalem, he says, you, be, you, you well understand that you did not get this on your own. Verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was uh, dedicated without blood for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying this is the blood of the testament which God had enjoyed unto you enjoined unto you moreover he sprinkled the blood on both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. All right. Now, uh, that's the only thing you can depend on this morning. You can't depend on this floor. You can't depend on what people write about the scripture. All you can do is depend on the scripture. Plus nothing, minus nothing. All you can depend on the, is the complete sacrifice of Christ. You cannot depend on, on uh, what you are doing. You can't depend on what someone else teaches. Right. All among our group, Spurgeon, 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 Spurgeon. You know why he was as vile and reprobate as me? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, some of his writings are good. Most people don't believe, no, but you know what he believed? He believed all the redeemed to make up the church. I don't believe that, do you? I don't think that's what the scripture teaches. So we know he was fallible, right? Mm -hmm. So we can't depend on Spurgeon. Mm -hmm. We can't depend on J.R. Grace. We can't depend on T.P. Simmons. Who are we going to depend on? Christ plus nothing right. minus nothing. Right. As the world's crumbling around us, that's what I point you to. As, as things go by, things get a little better, things a little, get a little worse. You know, I've been watching the gas prices and they're on the upswing again. And uh, you know what, I believe, because it's mostly political, they'll come a few, a few pennies down. And then you know what's gonna happen? They're gonna go back up. Right. <laughs> you know why? Because you can't depend on it. It's just as volatile as the uh, rest of this world. It may be 20 to 30, 40 cents more a gallon by the time we wake up in the morning because it's nothing dependable. Christ is the only thing that's dependable. Dependable. 